Everybody to the Tag Your It podcast. I am Ray Ray, and tonight I am Daveless. But what we do, we have somebody on the phone. His name is Joshua Jenkins. He is the pastor at Hope Baptist Church here in Springfield, Missouri. How you doing this evening, sir? Hey, I'm doing good. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, dude, I'm, I am so appreciative that you came on as well. And I'm trying to get your collar bubble up so at least people can see a picture of you live that did not work as seamlessly as I wanted it to but we got it now so people can see a nice beautiful picture that I snagged off Facebook um, of you but again uh, yeah you are the pastor of Hope Baptist Church uh, here in Springfield Um, is there you want to kind of just uh, introduce yourself a little bit more so that people know who you are what you do yeah like you said I'm one of the pastors at Hope Baptist here in Springfield um been living here for a while now with my wife Brittany and we have two two little boys Elias and Bryn Moore so uh, our hands are full and uh, we're having a lot of fun with that and that's really all there is to it with me I just pastor and and take care of my family awesome awesome well thank you for your work and it's one of those things uh, Hope Baptist is one that I uh, got to attend a few times and hang out uh, with some of the the people in the congregation um, great people so if you are looking for a place on the north side of Springfield they meet in the what time do you meet you meet like 10 11 o'clock we meet at 2 30 yeah. that's right 2 30 yeah. yeah so well, yeah. you know if you're looking for a later start time of a good group of people um, they're reformed um, you guys hold pretty confessional, right? Yeah, 1689. Yes, uh, yes. We're not strict subscriptionists, but uh, very co- closely to the 1689. All right. So, yeah, they're very uh, catechetical, which is awesome, in their liturgy and all that stuff. So if that's what you're looking for, there is a great group of people um, in that tradition um, that you can go hang out with and uh, worship Christ Um, our savior with. So um, with that said, um, let's get into uh, the issue tonight. Um, We, I just wanted to, this is kind of an on the fly thing that I started today um, after seeing another video. But uh, in the last time that we talked about house bill or HB 2285, I'd mentioned Josh and thanked him for uh, tagging me in a video talking about, Hey, there's this bill on abolitionism. Um, here's why we need to, uh, support this This is what we need to do. Um, so that was kind of the, uh, the starting ground for why Dave and I, uh, took on the issue and brought it on to tag your it. And so, um, again, Josh, you came on, I think it was, was it last night or the night before? Uh, I think it was like Friday night or or Saturday night. night. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I've been I've been hanging on it. Yeah, I've been hanging on it a couple of days anyway. So, um, but anyway, he comes on again, and there was just some uh, new information, and you talked with the uh, it was uh, Bob Moon or is that his name? Mike Moon. My, Mike yeah. Mike Mike not Bob Moon. I'm thinking of somebody else, but yeah, Mike Moon. So you talked with him, and uh, there's just some more information because um, that's what we're really trying to do is going like, what do we need to do? What can we do? What can we legally do so that we can be the bride of Christ and be pure and uh, be above reproach whenever we do something like this? Because we got to understand, as abolitionists, there's already a stigma um, that some people have produced that has not been biblical. You know, you we get called uh, abortion mill bombers and stuff like that, and that's not the way Christ has told us to get things done. Um, we can um, be respectful to the government because again, we believe that the government is instituted by God, that God has lifted and put people in positions, uh, certain times in history for certain things. And we, as Christian citizens, especially in a democracy, um, we get the privilege of showing, um, I guess, showing grace and showing the love of God through utilizing a system, the correct way, um, being means um, to get these things done. So that's what we want to do in this movement. We do not want to bomb people. We do not want to kill people. Um, I think uh, just to reiterate just something that my pastor Greg Gomer had mentioned a couple of weeks ago 
is, you know, we're not just trying to uh, get rid of abortion. We also want to show grace to people and go and, hey, doctors, you don't have to kill people. Um, you have skills, you have God-given talents that you have used against to rebel God against God, but you can use those things for life. And so we don't want to demolish everything. We just want to get rid of what is evil and get that out of our land and, and, and uh, let God's name be known in this country. So um, with that said, uh, so if you, again, so a few weeks ago, um, you gave us the information about uh, HB 2285. And um, how did you come to this knowledge of, of this bill? And uh, how can everyday normal citizens keep up and be in the know about these things of this kind of nature? Yeah, I first uh, heard about this bill back in January, which was when it was filed. I heard about it because I follow on Facebook a guy named Rusty Thomas, who I think you may be familiar with. Mm -hmm. Uh, an abolitionist from Texas. Um, I followed him a while back because I'd seen him do some stuff with Apologia, who I followed. And so, yeah, in January, Rusty posted uh, that there was an abolition bill filed here in Missouri. And so at that point, I didn't know where else to turn. So I just sent a message to him and asked him where I could learn more information or that sort of thing. And then he actually gave me uh, contact information for Professor Will Scroggins, who I know you talked to on here. Yeah. And so that's who I had talked to to get all the information I got. And then, uh, as you mentioned, after that, I emailed uh, Representative Mike Moon, who is the sponsor of this bill. And then he sent me some additional things we could do uh, to help support it. So that's how I heard about it. As far as how other normal citizens can keep up with it, um, unfortunately, I don't really know if one resource for them to turn to and to follow to stay up to date on this, because mm -hmm. um, certainly the media is not covering it as of yet. Um, I would just recommend following, if you can, look up Rusty Thomas on Facebook. You don't have to be his friend, but you can just follow him. Okay. Because he, he, that's how I found out about it. I know he's been up here at the Capitol. He was at the rally uh, back in February. Um, so that and there's you know, a couple other Facebook pages like uh, Free the States is an abolitionist group. Mm -hmm. They haven't I haven't seen them post anything about this here in Missouri, but they've been following the Oklahoma abolition movement very closely. So my guess is that when we start picking up steam here in Missouri, they'll probably jump in and and help follow that as well. Yeah, uh, that's about all I can know. Other than as well, you could go to the Missouri State. House of Representatives page, do the bill search, and you can always check on the status of the bill there as well. But you're seeing that information after the fact, you know, after there's a hearing or a vote or something. So yeah. that's about all I, I know of myself. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, just to reiterate to everybody getting in on the conversation, you know, HB uh, 2285 is something that has not hit committee yet. It's been read a few times, um, but there's uh, basically uh, Mike Moon is the only one that has sponsored it. Um, so it needs to get more attention from the representatives across the state of Missouri. Um, and so it's not getting a whole lot of attention. So therefore you're not going to see a whole lot of it. I mean, whenever we were thinking about, um, Oklahoma, um, it is pretty far ahead, especially compared to this bill. And so that's why it's gotten a lot of national attention, um, from different, uh, media markets and, um, outlets and stuff like that. But, you know, this is just really quiet. So Basically, um, you're going to just have to rely on um, your church and, and the people uh, in your community and listen to them and uh, look at these things. So please um, take to heart, go, go and uh, look at this bill, um, see its progress and whatnot, uh, whatever tag you're it can do or any or Josh, even on Facebook, you know, um, we need your help. This bill needs your help. This is about the people in this state, we can actually do something, but we actually have to do something. And so, you know, I know, uh, Josh and I were chit chatting before we started the show and, you know, it's like, you know, he hasn't really heard much other than me and Dave take the reins and talk about it and a few other people, but it's not a whole lot. So what we need to do is get the ball rolling, talk in our churches about this thing, see if we can find some support um, get some emails out, get some calls out. So that's the only way you're going to know, 
you're going to know and and that other people are going to know is by word of mouthing this right now because unfortunately it's buried and luckily somebody was there for um for for him and for me to uh be able to get this uh information to at least get the conversation started so um so let's uh talk about uh some issues i want to kind of get your point um your point of view as a pastor um, especially, you know, you've got a smaller church, a younger church here in town. And uh, in this last episode um, that we talked with uh, Will Scroggins, uh, we talked about the fact that there are three fronts in this uh, in this issue. You know, we got pro-choice, we got pro-life, and we got abolition. Um, and another, and I think from what you said in that second video, I think more people need to hear, um, because I don't think that really got talked about in that last show, um, but you mentioned there's a, there is a difference between pro-life and abolition and it's actually working out, um, really should be in a negative way. We should take it very negatively. But, uh, what were you saying in that video about how is this pro-life abolition distinction working out in Oklahoma? Yeah. So just following from afar, the, the abolition movement in Oklahoma and, and their bill to abolish abortion the Oklahoma Right to Life, one of the largest national uh, right, uh, pro-life organizations, has actually been, you would think they would want to support an abolition bill, but it turns out they have been actually working against it. And I think when it comes down to uh, understanding the political differences between pro-life, what we consider pro-life legislation versus the abolition movement, um, so if we back up and think about the way our government works, we have in our government, uh, it's, it was designed with three branches of government, the executive branch, which is the presidency and his cabinet, the legislative branch, which is the Congress, who has the authority and power to make law, and then the judicial branch, which is the courts. And the courts do not have authority or power to make law. They simply render judicial rulings in specific court cases. Mm -hmm. uh, they interpret the law. They make opinions in specific cases. And so back in 1973, I think it was, when Roe v. Wade was ruled on, that opinion from the Supreme Court was not the making of a law. It did not actually legalize abortion in the states. Um, but because people misunderstand the way the government works, whether it's ignorance or on purpose or whatever, um, people treat the Supreme Court as if it is like the supreme god of the land and what they say is law, when in reality it's not. Yeah. And so what you have then is the pro-life organizations, they come into the states and they start you know, working with legislators to pass their pro-life legislations. You, know, you have things like 20-week bans or you know, heartbeat bills or they'll have regulations for – you know, having sanitary abortion facilities and stuff like that. And when they are passing these laws, say a 20-week bill, what they are actually doing in terms of the, the legal rendering of it is they are actually in that state legalizing abortion when Roe v. Wade did not actually legalize it and make it a law. Yeah. And so the, what, what's happened then over the, over the 40 last 40-plus 40 years is pro-life legislation has actually made abortion legal yeah. in the various states because they say now say they pass the 20 week bill they say okay this is a law in whatever state that you can now actually kill your baby just not if it's 20 weeks or later yeah. whereas the supreme court decision does not make that law and so the abolitionist comes in and, and when they want to abolish abortion now what they have to do is repeal all that old legislation, 40-plus years of legislation. So if you go and you look up HB 2285, it's 81 pages long, and the vast majority of the bill is just old regulations that are struck out because they have to repeal that in order to abolish yeah, So abortion. they're actually having, yeah, they're having to repeal pro-life <clears throat> laws, right. things that were made yeah. because of the pro-life movement. They're having right. to repeal that because, again, based on a false premise that abortion was a legal thing to do because the judicial system said so. 
you know, so, I mean, this is just a, this is a big mess. Um, you know, there's another thing that, um, uh, I was talking with a buddy about, um, I mean, cause it's not really viewed that pro-life is a problem, um, because, and, and I mean, given it the benefit of a doubt that we want to be optimistic, right. Uh, we want to look and take the best things out of things. Um, and so, you know, it's talking to my buddies, like, you know, I'm all for abolition, but it's, you know, it's, it, he sees it sort of a daunting task. It's not going to get, <laughs> you know, get voted, excuse me for coughing there, <laughs> but, uh, it's not going to get voted. So it's not really that he's for incrementalism in in a way, but he's like, you know, if we can just get anything, you know, if we can just get that heartbeat bill and at least that gives, get some kids off the table for now, or that 20 week bill that just gets some, gets rid of the city, some of the killing for now. And it's like, you know, I, I understand the intention and the intention is good, but that's still, you know, and I understand my buddy would totally recognize, yeah, we're still allowing the murder of some that are still human beings made in the image of God. And it is absolutely wrong to do so. Um, you know, the optimism is at least we're getting that. And like I said, good. But the thing is, is it's just the fact that the pro-life issue has messed everything up for the past 40 years. That's why it's even hard to even get, like we've compounded problems to where abolition after the opinion of Roe versus Wade might've been hard enough to deal with. Now it's even harder because of just the compromising nature of pro-life. And so, you know, that's, it's one of those things that we are dealing with the sins of the past and sin rolls downhill. And, you know, there's got to be a point where we just get fed up, right? We should get fed up with this stuff and we go, okay, we're done playing games. We're killing people or we're not, we're not just killing people. We are murdering people. That that's the other trigger word is people are using this murder word, you know, and murder means something. It means that you are unjustifiably taking the life of a human being. And, you know, it's, it's not just killing <laughs> it's murder. Right. So, yeah. you know, and we, we just can't let that happen. So, um, you know, from your studies, uh, you know, you're a pastor, um, you're preaching and all that kind of things. Like, you know, I think just for the podcast sake, uh, just from the theological mind, uh, behind a pulpit, you know, give us a, you know, biblical reasoning to be, uh, an abolitionist. Yeah, I, I believe that abolitionism in terms of abortion is the only consistent Christian position, because as Christians, uh, we must confess that Jesus is Lord over every area of life. And so when it comes to this issue of abortion, we have to begin with the presupposition that Jesus is Lord here. And so from there, we then ask the question, how do we submit this area to the Lordship of Christ? Yeah. And we do so by looking at what the Bible says about this issue, uh, because Scripture is God's revealed uh, will, authoritative will to us. And so just looking at that very briefly, I would just say, first, the Bible teaches that the, in, the intentional, uh, unjustified taking of a life, as you said, is murder. And murder is both a sin and a crime. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, when it rela how that relates to abortion is the fact that the Bible teaches that life begins at conception. Uh, one place just to point to for a defense of that would be somewhere like Psalm 51, where David just says in passing, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Yeah. And so in that divinely inspired Psalm, God assigns personhood to what is there at conception inside mm -hmm. a mother. And at the point of conception, that Psalm says that that woman is a mother. And so David also, he calls what's there at conception, he says it's, he calls it me. So there yeah. he's assigning the personhood. And so therefore, you know, if, if murder is the unjustified taking of a life and life begins at conception, then anything short of abolition in terms of abortion is whether you intend it to be or not, is in some way the condoning of murder at, at some point along the, along the scale. Yeah. Um, and one other thing I'll say on that, too, is you were talking a moment ago about how we have friends who they want to see abolition abolished, but they also can appreciate, you know, 
some of the, you know, the heartbeat bills, the things that move us closer and closer. But I would just say to that very lovingly, because I, I understand that position totally. If you apply that logic to other areas, you can begin to see the absurdity of it. Yeah. For example, the current state of abortion in our country would be like if the Supreme Court ruled that it was legal to commit rape, and then we have these organizations that decided to come in along and, and work with uh, state legislators, and they said, um, we want laws that allow rape, just not if you are six years old or younger. Yeah. Uh, you, you can rape someone as long as they're young enough. Now, we would think that's absurd and crazy and immoral, and we would be absolutely right. And so with abortion, that's the pro-life groups have come along, and they advocate for heartbeat bills, 20-week bans, or things like that. And what they're saying then is it's okay to murder your child as long as they're young enough. And then what do we do? We, we celebrate it as if it's a victory. And that's that's just absurd. So, yeah, uh, I mean, like the whole yeah pro life pro choice debate is pretty much debating on where do you draw the line? Uh, do you draw the line um, when you eat? Uh, you draw it at the horse, you know, so you eat everything from the horse down to the rabbit on that uh, billboard, or do you yeah, draw yeah. it at the cow? You know, and right. then people arguing, I I can't believe I can't believe you would eat the horse, <laughs> you know, and, and stuff like that. So. Um, it just becomes arbitrary, arbitrary. Um, then you've got the whole uh, Proverbs thing. You know, you you are arguing like the fool and becoming just like him. And, yep. it's, and it's finally after 40 years showing. Um, yep. And so we need to deal with it. We need to repent. We need to say we were wrong. And we need to move um, out of repentance, which is toward not murdering babies and supporting anything that we can um, not to murder babies. In this right. case, you know, like, and again, we're not neglecting all the other issues that would come out of this. It's just, we want the murder of babies to stop. And then, you know, and it's not, and then, but at the same time, work on this stuff of, okay, we've got women that are being raped. How can we take care of them? How can we yeah. make sure both of them um, live and uh, know the love of the Savior, Jesus Christ, and hopefully become to know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and become a part of our church um, family. So, I mean, there's a whole lot more and it's not a, once we get this, we'll do this. We're not, you know, that's the other side is trying to hold us hostage here. Um, we're not trying to hold it hostage. It's just our conversation is about let's stop murdering babies. Stop making arguments that will allow it, let you feel good about murdering babies in that hostage situation. You know, let's take, oh, well, once you have legislation that takes care of these ladies over here, then we'll, we'll stop the abortion, but that's just to get whatever else you want. That's a selfish, um, asking instead of trying to work all these things at the same time. But the main central issue is that babies are being murdered. Murder is murder. Murder is wrong. And you know it, and, uh, we need to stop it. So that's what we're all about. And so, um, again, from that, uh, pastor's perspective, um, this is what we really need to work on because we need to stop talking about this stuff. We need to get on the move. We can talk all day. Um, I can have a podcast and have people on. Um, it might get something done. It might get something started. The seeds get planted and that's good, but it has to get planted in somebody and they have to do something about it. And if there's nobody doing about it, then, you know, I feel like I have to do something about it or you have to do something about it. You're talking about it, Right. Um, so as a pastor of a church, um, what are you doing to lead your people in this debate and into action? Yeah, as you, uh, the very most practical thing we've been doing, obviously we've been talking about this at our church as of late. We also, uh, recently, not yesterday, but two Sundays ago, watched the documentary babies are murdered here mm. after mm. our service with our congregation and uh, that was very, very helpful. Uh, not that our people weren't already there, but it was just good, especially with now we have an opportunity with a bill here in Missouri to get behind it. Yeah. But yeah, we've had our people uh, talk to them about contacting their state representatives. And the other thing along that line, um, which this is what Mike Moon emailed me, he said, not only can we contact our state representatives, 
but also we need to contact as well the Speaker of the House of the state of Missouri. Yes. And that's Elijah Har, and because he is the one that has the power and responsibility to uh, appoint the bill to a committee. And he can do that at any point in time, whether he has a lot of support or not much. He can just do that whenever he wants, if my understanding is correct. So your state rep, contact them, but also Speaker of the House, Elijah Hart. So we've been we've, we've been doing that. Our people have been doing that. Um, and then, you know, uh, the other thing we do in our church as well, we begin our service with a pastoral prayer. Hmm. And built into our regular pastoral prayers, we always pray for those in authority over us, the civil magistrates. Yes. And so— Now, with this uh, abolition bill come up in Missouri, it's just been already built. That time's already been built into our service. So now we just specifically pray for that issue when it comes time for us to pray for our magistrates. Um, And also, of course, in our prayer meetings. Um, And the other thing, the other really practical thing that we are, we haven't done it yet, but our plan is actually to do it this coming Sunday, to start this Sunday is when we meet for our prayer meeting, uh, which we actually just changed it, we're going to start meeting before our service on Sunday for our prayer meeting. We're actually going to write uh, physical letters to send in the mail to our representatives and those in, in the government, um, especially pertaining, obviously, to this issue here and now. So you can awesome. call, you can email, and then a physical letter. I think that would we're hoping it would just mean a lot more. You know, you always feel that way in today's day and age. You know, you get something physical in the mail, and it just kind of means something a little bit, a little bit more. So we're hoping that can have an impact yeah. on some of these legislators. Yeah. So yeah. So basically, you're saying get creative, contact, yeah. pray, um, actually do something. You know, this is a uh, one of those cool things. Is uh, in the barber shop. You know, I get to talk to a lot of people and I've got this older gentleman in a big Baptist church here in Springfield, Missouri. And he loves the fact that I do ministry. I talk about the podcast. He's always talking about that stuff. And last time he came in, I mentioned like, cause it was, it was the day after we did the last episode on this. And uh, so I told him all the information and he was, just, he gave me his business card with his email. He's like, email me everything that you have. Um, I'll see if what I can do. So, I mean, even the older generation can get into this, this can be something um, that can bring the generations together. Um, this, this yeah. is the gospel and this can totally show the world, the gospel that it's not just uh, young people, um, but you know, the older people can get in on this. They can make phone calls. They can send emails. They can write letters and send it in. I mean, that generation probably still cares more for the systems of government um, than yeah. even the old, or the, you know, compared to the younger kids um, like us, which have a lot more anti-authority <laughs> issues. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we just kind of like went to that's kind of the post-modern thing is we're trying to destroy these institutions for anarchy <laughs> in a way. Um, but you know, like we we could use this as a growing gosh gospel um, experience in our churches as we come together over the issue of the life of a baby that uh, God has put there in the womb of a mother. Um, no matter what situation surrounds it, um, God can redeem that and, and save that. And we can be means in doing that. So um, we just got to do something. And so we need to stop talking about it. You know, I mean, we need to continue talking about it, but just stop just talking about it. Um, you can do something about it by talking about it and then doing something else, like actually talking to your representatives, or as he said, the new information is to contact the speaker of the house, because apparently he has the authority just to go, Oh, it doesn't matter if it's not sponsored by all these representatives, I'm going to make it go to committee. And wouldn't that be awesome if you could just skip the step of the representatives and have somebody to be like, Oh man, I really like this bill because I'm tired of murdering babies and that, and and that going on, um, in our, in our state. Um, and if he would do that, that'd be awesome. So pray for not just your representatives and talk to them, but also pray for your house speaker of the house and, uh, that he would see this, uh, information and that he would pass it along to get to go to committee. So, um, with this, one other, uh, one other oh, yeah. thing I'll say real, real quick here. Sorry to jump in. Go for it. Uh, also, it probably wouldn't hurt, actually, another guy in my church. Uh, he actually 
sent an email to Billy Long, mm. which he's a uh, federal representative to the federal House of Reps, so he doesn't have any jurisdiction to vote on this. Yeah. Um, he mistakenly emailed him, but Billy Long's people did respond. They said, you know, we it's not our jurisdiction, but they recommended as well contacting uh, Governor Mike Parson. Mm -hmm. uh, not that he votes on it, but he's basically the president of Missouri, you know? Yeah. So he would, uh, is, you know, letting him know what the people want, just if nothing else, so that he doesn't oppose it in any way. Yeah. So and I mean, that'd Missouri be a is, really yeah. good person of peace, um, in the government. That's something that we do know. Cause unfortunately, uh, in your side of Springfield, um, you have crystal Quaid and it's just really sad that, uh, that part of Springfield is, uh, represented represented by her and uh because she's endorsed by planned parenthood and all these things and hey i've got yeah. my little boy showing up in the room <laughs> and I, this usually happens but usually i have dave to do some talking <laughs> while i take care of business um, but anyway uh since this is a great show about kids and saving kids and loving kids i'm gonna let my boy uh jump yeah. in on this show anyway so he's gonna be on here so he might jump around <laughs> and dance oh, one one more everybody. thing I'll interject yeah, here if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and talk and I'm going to take care of business so uh talk for about at least 30 seconds. Okay, yeah. One thing I would definitely recommend and say that's very important whenever you contact your representative or the speaker of the house, do so in a way that is intentionally a Christian way presenting, you know, presenting a gospel message with it, you know, doing it from a Christian worldview. Because we have in Missouri a lot of Republican legislators, a lot of people who call themselves pro-life, a lot of people who profess to be Christians. And what if we are presenting a gracious, gospel-focused message of abolition, we never know when God could kind of wake up his sleeping Christians in office or his kind of cruise control Christians and, and wake them up to see the urgency of this thing. So... Uh, in fact, I know that Senator Silk in Oklahoma, who is the sponsor of, of Oklahoma's abolition bill, he was elected just as kind of a generic Republican, generically pro-life, and someone presented him with a Christian abolition argument, and that woke him up, and that led him to sponsoring his bill. So we never know. We could, we could, uh, God can work through the power of the gospel as we are using the gospel in this way. Uh, to wake up some of our representatives. So yeah, and I, I, I just caught that last end, and I think that's all I needed to hear because uh, you know whenever we think about it, um, a lot of people just kind of already go into this idea in despair, right? They're just kind of like, man, this is a lot to ask of sinful people to vote on. There's a lot to expect in a world, and and I mean. You you look at the dispensationalism. So you've got you know the I the, the you know, I, I I'm an optimistic Amil guy. I haven't like totally embraced post millennialism yet. But come on I, over. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is though is I have um, from the post mill position been challenged by Do you trust the gospel? Yeah. Do you trust the gospel? If God has said something, if Jesus has promised something, are you going to doubt it? So if we pray and we ask and he says, I will give it to you. If you ask it in my name, are we going to, are we going to, well, oh man, abolition is no, no, no it's not too much to ask. Right. Do we That's trust right. the gospel? Do we trust the Holy spirit to convict people of sin? Do we trust the new covenant when he says that I will pour out my spirit on, on the people, right. And that they will know me. They won't teach each other about me. They will know me. You know, so are we trusting the Holy Spirit? Are we trusting the gospel? And so um, if we get into the attitude of despair, you know, and, and where I'm stuck in the whole all mill, post mill thing is the wheat and weeds growing together and who gets to destroy the grass, you know, sort of a, a attitude. But, <laughs> you know, is, is it is it uh, the church and, 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 and people becoming uh all Christianized before Christ comes um, because we both believe in, in the uh, Christ coming and consummated kingdom coming after that same now period, you know? So it's like, there's not much difference, but you know, I'm optimistic just because it is the gospel um, that changes hearts. Um, yes. At the same time, it is the smell of death to those who are perishing and there's going to be opposition 
um, no matter what, but we've got to trust the gospel and not get into despair mode. And this could be um, a lot of that, uh, just our eschatology um, in on our attitude toward these things. And so no matter, I, I'm going to have to say, no matter what your eschatology is, um, we can agree that the gospel works because God says it works. Okay. And it's not based on what we do. We can totally screw up everything all day, but let God be true, though everyone a liar. And even Paul was like, man, I'm glad that these uh, there's some false teachers out there that have preached the gospel and God still worked through it, right? <laughs> and so God, right. Yeah. You know, so even though they will be condemned for their heresy, if there was a little kernel of the gospel that set in somebody's heart and then God used that to grow them the correct direction, it was all of God anyway. That's the whole point, right? And so we whether must, in preach and or in truth. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. there we go. So we need to trust the gospel whenever we get into here. So um, just to get just some more insight um, as a pastor and and what you've been doing. You know, what's the reaction of your congregation to um, some of this abolitionist talk? Our church has been all on board. Yeah. <laughs> so I've yeah. faced opposition in our church for it. Um, the, uh, the, so yeah, our, our church is all in, um, you know, we're a smaller church. So that probably is one reason yeah. pastors, of larger congregations are going to have to maybe be a little more bold, be, be more courageous because they're probably going to face some opposition. Yes. Um, but yes, yeah, for me, I have not personally, so I'm grateful for that. Grateful for our people being, being there. You know, it's, that's encouraging to me. Yeah, well, that's that's awesome, and I you know I pray that for any pastor. But yeah, we do. As you know, as a pastor, you have to preach the truth, don't you? Right. And you have to be ready in season and out of season. And it's because it's not for the people. It's because God is coming in wrath. He is coming in judgment, and uh, people are going to experience that. And you're out there preaching the gospel, going, there is salvation. And so, you know, it's hoping that people come and they hear the voice of Jesus, but it's not like, you know, we, we put place too much emphasis on man, even when we preach the gospel, it's about God and his actions and what he's going to do while you're preaching. And so in that sense, um, you know, you're not trying to preach a message for, for people to get liked. You're, you're supposed to be preaching a gospel that is offensive to people that are going to be offended by it easily yeah but you got to stand up there and so even though you know going into this that this could be a divisive issue you know i've got pro-life people that might not understand abolitionism um and they might get ticked off for a while you know we need to say well we're brothers and sisters so we're going to take the slow track and talk about it and i'll I'll give you information we'll get in the scriptures about this thing and hopefully be persuaded to abolitionism um but it does ne- definitely truth does divide. And if somebody does not want to believe that a baby is a human being and does not deserve to be murdered at all, and they're not wanting to act out of that by supporting abolitionism, you know, that's on them there. They will exclude themselves if you are doing the right thing. So um, in that sense, you know, I guess you'd have to say uh, struggle on Kristen soldier. And there's my boy again. <laughs> <laughs> so um so you haven't really uh, exper- have you have you talked to anybody outside your church you know have you experienced any sort of opposition at all so far just from obviously the pro choice friends that I have you know okay. and that's that's a given um but the benefit of being consistently an abolitionist on this issue when you're is is you can be principled all the way through when you're talking to the pro-choice people and you don't concede any points. You don't concede your authority or your ground because I think that's one of the distinct distinctives of the Christian abolition movement is that you're coming at it from a distinctively explicitly Christian worldview standing on God's word as the authority. So, uh, that's a real benefit when you are talking to pro-choicers. Um, but no, um, People that I've talked to, even outside of church, I haven't had. I know there is pro-life opposition to other people who are abolitionists, but I personally just have not experienced that yet. Anyway, so yeah. you know, I think it. I think a lot of normal pro-life people they want abolition. They just don't. 
they just haven't been necessarily confronted with these explicit abolition arguments. So I think when you just talk with people who are professing Christians, most of the time, I think most of them, in my experience anyway, have come around to it. Yeah. So sure. I know there's those out there that it, that, that isn't the case, but awesome. that's my that's been my experience. Well, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that from you, and uh, and I pray that uh, you don't get so much opposition, you know, any opposition from the Christian side. Um, and I just say, you know, keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, keep us in the loop. Keep putting out your videos live. And it'd just be really awesome to have tag your it and then our respective churches get a coalition of people together. Um, you know, like we were saying earlier, you know, I think it was a couple of years ago where I think it's like, you know, they had free the nipple and people are out there showing skin. Right. You know, so like if they're if they're not afraid of that, like why would be why would we be afraid to go downtown and tell the world what people are? And that they they don't have to kill their babies. Um, there's no justifiable reason to. Um, and and that there are churches that care, and that uh, you know Jesus died for sinners, and that uh, even if they've had one in the past, um, it can be forgiven, and that they don't have to stand condemned in Jesus Christ. And we can go out there and share the love. Um, you know, we can do two things: we can get rid of the murder but then redeem the jobs of the people that are committing abortions. We can redeem the lives of people that have had abortions um, and redeem these kids' lives and, and save them and, and bring them in, hopefully, to the family of, of uh, our churches and everything because God brings them in. Um, and so I think with that said, I think we've got another really good episode um, on this topic of HB uh, 2285. And Josh, thank you so much for everything that you've done so far. Uh, leading your church and letting us know about it and then coming on the podcast to talk about it. Hey, I appreciate you having me on and really glad that you guys are talking about it. You know, oh, yeah. the word's got to get out. So grateful for you guys' work on this. Oh, well, we'll we will continue. And I'm glad that I uh, have the support of Dave and doing this alone <laughs> tonight and just on the fly and everything. So um, we'll give him big old thank you as well on the show. Um, but I will uh, end up closing out this show tonight. Um, this is the Tag Your Podcast. I'm Ray Ray. Soli. Dale. Gloria. Oh.